Christina Atkinson serves as Chief Experience Officer with Ball Corp and as CEO of Ball Club's Tuso Symphony. Atkinson first served as Project Specialist at Ball Corp beginning in January 2019. As Chief Experience Officer, Atkinson is responsible for the development, execution, and oversight of Ball Corp's strategic initiatives. For over 26 years, Atkinson has served in many roles in the credit union industry, including accounting, finance, and information technology. Atkinson most recently served as a CFO for Life Credit Union in Nashville, Tennessee. Prior to her tenure at Life Credit Union, Atkinson was CFO for Southeast Financial Credit Union of Franklin, Tennessee, where she was instrumental in the implementation of strategic initiatives, including several mergers and system conversions. Atkinson is a graduate of Middle Tennessee State University, where she earned her BBA in accounting in 1995. She went on to then earn her CPA in 1997. Atkinson has been married for 26 years and has one daughter who is a sophomore in college. While managing Ball Corp's investment portfolio and liquidity, Philip Cochran also directs the marketing, sales, analytics, accounting, and support functions of all Ball Corp investment services to both client credit unions and client corporate credit unions. Joining Ball Corp in August of 2004, Philip has served in the consulting department as well as in the investment department. He was named Chief Investment Officer in 2010. He also sits on the Seaton Investment Solution LLC Board of Managers. Prior to joining the corporate, Philip was an investment manager at a private investment firm in the Nashville area. Cochran is also a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Philip has a Bachelor of Business degree with a focus in finance from Belmont University, a Master's of Science in Accounting from Maribel University, and holds FINRA Series 7 and 63 security licenses. Please welcome Christina Atkinson and Philip Cochran. Well, thank you and thank you for joining us. I hope everyone had a great time last night. I wanna first start off by thanking Wade and his team. He put on a great 40th anniversary celebration. Um, we appreciate everything he's done. Um, and I also wanna Thank whoever did the video. We sound very important, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so anyway, thank you for joining us. So today we're gonna talk about the pitfalls and perils of the balance sheet in today's environment. That is a lot of words. So we're gonna try to unpack that. Um, but first we wanna start off with an audience poll. You guys have a flag in front of you, red and green. So let me get you to the question. Okay, I don't know who used this. Oh. Okay, technical difficulties. <laughs> there we go, thank you. Um, we wanna talk about rate increases. <clears throat> so we wanna know what you guys think when rates are going to rise. So if you think rates are gonna rise in 2022, raise your red flag. 23, raise your green flag. 23 or raise your green flag and turn it upside down. And for those that are joining us virtually, just put your answer in the chat. So let's see. A lot of greens. What do you think, Philip? Ooh, I see some 24s. I see a, maybe a couple of, oh, I see one, 22. Looks like 23 wins. What do you think? Yep, 23. Yeah. Okay, remember your answer because we're going to ask you again at the end to see if it changes. Spoiler alert. I know, <laughs> but also too, let me, let me, so Ball Corp has the answer. Let me start there. Ball Corp has the answer. We know when rates are gonna rise. We use the magic eight ball. So let's see. I don't know how to use it. This one's a little different. This one's, this is, we borrowed this from Jerome Powell. Yeah. So. Oh, 22, it is decidedly so. I think the eight ball is wrong. So everybody that raised the green flag or I mean, yeah. it's, it's 2022. So yeah. that's it. We, go. we can all go home now. Yep, we have the done. answers, we're good. We're done. So anyway, sometimes you wonder if that's exactly how they're figuring out yes. how to do this. You know, so we we thought it'd be fun to just give you a peek behind the curtain. Right, right. In other words, we don't know either. No. <laughs> Still not clicking. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the balance sheet. You know, if you ever took accounting class, you the first day you walked in, you learned that assets equals liabilities plus capital. We all know that. It's been the same forever. But what's changed within the last 18 months? We're now describing our balance sheet as inflated. It's a new description. And why is it inflated? It's because all that cash you're sitting on. 
the cash that you guys weren't expecting to come in and you thought would leave, but it's still there. It may be trickling down a little bit, but it sure isn't going out as fast as it came in. So, you know, the thing is, is what we're seeing from the corporate side, it was, we're seeing the, the money that came in setting in shares, share drafts and money markets, short-term, not long-term. We're not seeing those long-term certificates like we once did. So what happens on the asset side? We're doing mortgages. We're doing refis on mortgages. You're doing some car loans, but if you drive around a lot of car lots, they're empty. There's no cars, so it means there's no loans. So if you have long-term assets, short-term deposits, you got mismatches. That was a disruption that we could kind of see coming, but there's also disruptions that are there, that are present, that maybe we see, maybe we don't see. So we wanna kind of give you a glimpse of the disruptions we think are coming or that are here so that you guys can peek around the corner and basically manage your balance sheet. So Philip's going to start with our favorite topic, inflation. Yeah, and before and if we can get the next slide, perfect. Yeah. And before I start, I, I'm going to say something that if you've known me for any given period of time, you've probably heard me say this many times. You know, back in the day, and I'd like to say that back in the day was 10, 15 years ago, but I realized that I'm much older than I used to be. So maybe 25 years ago at this point, uh, the job of a, an investment professional, a broker, if you will, was to give you information you didn't have access to. So we're, they were helping you figure out, here's, here's the data that you don't see. Maybe you don't have your own Bloomberg terminal, whatever it is. There wasn't business news 24 hours a day back then. Today, the role is totally different. Today, it's let's take the 99.9% .9 of you know, Bravo Sierra that we have out there in the world and let's bring it down to what actually matters. So our job now is really to be a filter. Okay. And that's really difficult because with COVID, we've seen the politicization, if you will, of a lot of things. So 15 years ago, we started to see commoditization of so much. And now it's the politicization, politicization. I don't know if that's the right word. I'm just going to go channel my best George W. Bush right now and come up with my own <laughs> strategy words. Okay. So the, the point is, you know, it's, it's try to decipher what, what really isn't important and what is important. And that's tough because we find ourselves getting stuck in a situation where we want to make decisions emotionally. And by making decisions emotionally, most of the time we're going to mess up. In the investment world, the big joke is that the stock market is emotional, the bond market is intelligent and smart. We kind of sit back and we're more macro. We're looking at lots of things, we're not emotional. And the reason for that is because the bond market's considered, you know, it's institutional investors. It's a lot of professionals and the stock market can be hedge fund managers that are shooting for whatever's hot, uh, insurance companies, and a lot of retail investors who make bad decisions. I mean, retail investors just, just do. I mean, Wall Street is the house and the house always wins. Okay, so getting all that just aside so that we are on the same you know, like starting point, the disruptions that we're facing today are ridiculous. And the first one and the big question is inflation because everybody wants to know, is it transitory or is it gonna stick around? Six months ago, I absolutely believed wholeheartedly that inflation was transitory. Um, anybody that looks at today's CPI, PPI, or PCE numbers and compares them year over year and thinks, oh my gosh, we're at 8%, we're at 7.8, this is terrible. It's meaningless. Last year was nothing. We were negative. It was, you know, the world stopped. Of course, it's going to be big. I mean, if it was 10 today, it, that would be great. That doesn't scare me. What scares me is the influx of cash and so much of the mindset that's changing everywhere that now all of a sudden, it's not just about the pricing. It's not just about... Um, getting product, but it's getting people back to work. And when we start talking about having to increase wages to attract people back into the market, because we've all heard there's a million more jobs than there are people supposedly unemployed, and they won't come and take these jobs. Now we're talking wage inflation. Wage inflation becomes permanent. You don't back that out. You don't hire somebody for this salary and then pay them less a year or two later. So the big fear right now, legitimate fear, is that enticing people to come back into the workplace is going to lead to wage growth that's going to make inflation be permanent and not transitory. That's huge. Um, another big disruption is just the supply chain. Northern California, three months ago, started having big problems with fuel. Their fuel prices were going up and everybody else's fuel prices were going down. And it was because they couldn't get truck drivers to run the fuel up, up the coast. Well, that problem's happening everywhere now, but not with fuel, with everything else. When was the last time you went to Best Buy or Electronic Express and tried to find 
an audio video receiver. I did that two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Between the two places, there were maybe five devices on their shelves and nobody that understood anything about them. The reason they gave me is microchips. They can't get anything. Now consider the fact that Best Buy and Electronic Express, the two biggest you know, electronic retailers can't get audio video receivers because of chips. And all of a sudden this becomes a real science fiction you know, B movie, you know, it's not just the pandemic. It's not just everything, you know, this is real. I mean, we're not getting the simple things that we really want. Trucks, cars, I mean, F-150, number one selling truck for how many decades? And they st- how many times has Ford shut down and stopped building them through the pandemic because they couldn't get chips? These are real problems. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who is a, I'll just call him a shipping mogul because it sounds cool. I, every time I say that, I picture the Monopoly guy but he's a, he's a muckety muck, if you will, in the shipping industry. And he was explaining to me that they're really scared. Like we don't know yet how bad what they're seeing, how, how bad it's going to get. He says, we got ports right now in the U S that are just totally backlogged. They're clogged up with containers that they can't get pushed around the country. Okay. They just can't get enough drivers to grab them and take them. So inside ports, coastal ports, you name it, they're, they're full. It's a bottleneck of containers that can't get in. The problem that that presents like long-term is those containers need to be offloaded, emptied, and returned so more product can be brought over afterwards. So we're, we have bottleneck issues. We've got stuff sitting still, and then we've got you know months from now, a huge backup of the fact that everything else is not even being loaded yet. And you want to talk about inflationary costs. Uh, he described one client that wanted to pay $30,000 a container to have containers shipped when normally it was like 250 to 2,500, depending on what the containers are. That's inflation. That's scary. All right. Liquidity, um, which will feed into the inflationary concerns because let's be honest, our liquidity right now is ridiculous. You guys saw the stats yesterday on Volcor's asset size. Our assets mirror yours. As your assets grow, our assets grow. Your cash sits with us. I have more cash right now than we usually have in total asset size. And like you, we're trying to figure out what to do with that cash, right? How transitory, if you will, is that the cash that's sitting on our balance sheet. The liquidity is coming in because of all the government funded programs that are just pumping cash in. Now under the previous administration, this stuff was funded through the sell of debt, which also helped inflate the balance sheet of the Fed and keep interest rates pushed down. And now we're talking possible taxation. So what kind of effect is that gonna have? You got lots of cash coming in. You got lots of inflationary um, disruptors that are, I love that word. That's like the key word for this. I, yeah. I need to, right now, Cassie is not clicking how many times I say, um, she's counting how many times I say disruption. Um, Part of the world. And, and right there, I had both back to back. But the <laughs> point is that we're sitting on a ton of cash. All of that cash makes the value of the dollar go down. Um, product is sitting in ports and can't be delivered. Prices are going up because of the demand. Fuel prices are going to start going back up again because of the same reason. There's just no end here in sight at this point in time. So the idea that I had six months ago that this was transitory, I can't say that. Now, the really good news is I also can't say that it's going to be permanent. So I, as much as I hate the two armed economists, I'm going to say on the one hand, you know, this could be permanent inflation. And on the other hand, it could all go away because every time I think I've seen everything, something new comes along. Never even saw that one coming. I mean, it literally is like being in a, starring in a, in a B science fiction movie. All right, so now let's talk about operations, right? business operations in general, because now all of a sudden, the whole world has realized we don't have to go to the office anymore. My next door neighbor is a commercial builder. His, the company he used to be a partner of actually built the bat building here downtown. And he's scared to death because from their perspective, when Vanderbilt's done building, when Facebook is done expanding, and when Amazon and Oracle are done, they're afraid that there's not going to be anything else left for them to build out here, and there's just going to be a bunch of empty buildings. So we've got situations where people realize they can telecommute now, they don't need to be in the office. Um, we've got members, I've, we've got some credit unions that have found really good ways of, of converting their business operations through the pandemic in that they actually shifted to appointments only. And the members love the appointments as opposed to just having the doors open, anybody could come in. And that 
may end up being like a permanent business model. But there's so many other disruptors just to our day-to-day -day business that it's causing all kinds of concerns over where do we spend our money? How do we get people in the door to, to actually provide the functions that we need? And what functions do we need? And what is the answer on the corporate level? I mean, is the answer to develop greater technologies that allow you to work with fewer people? That's definitely the way of the future. But how popular is that going to be when you don't all of a sudden need the people that you've had in your shops for so long? And then let's go to COVID, right? And, and COVID is, of course, the reason for most of these things that have come along. And we need to put in perspective here, the last big economic disruptor that we had was the housing bubble burst in 2007, 2008. And that was huge. But COVID is ridiculously bigger. The world shut down for months. People lived in fear in their homes. My pool is now 11 months late because there was no fiberglass, there was no resin, there was nobody at the factory to do it. And now all the contractors who make their living doing this have everybody in the world wanting a pool, but they can't get any of the materials. They're sitting on their thumbs and doing nothing. People, how many people have lost loved ones? I mean, this, it, it's the idea that we're gonna go back to normal, forget it. I mean, you, you're living in a dream if you think it's all just gonna return. It's not going to. It'll take time, some things will get back and some things won't, and it's just the way it is. But these disruptions that we're facing right now are having a massive impact on the balance sheet and it's, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Because like Christina was saying, all of a sudden now you're gonna have a mismatch. You know, what about the aging population? You know, our mem members that buy certificates are no longer buying certificates. And we got younger folks now who don't want certificates. And so your balance sheet now, your liabilities, you can't just go out and invest in whatever you want and make long-term loans because you're much more sensitive to the fact that your liability side, your funding side of your balance sheet is shorter term. You're like me. Our balance sheet is almost entirely funded by overnight cash. So I have a very limited amount of fixed investments that I can do. And that potentially is where your balance sheets might start going. Sorry. I'm okay, who's crying now and who wants <laughs> to go home and get in a corner, right? But there was some positivity there, right? It's, it's gonna end, we just don't know when. <laughs> Right. And that's the whole point is you've got to manage to it. You've got to manage if rates were to rise in 22, 23 or 24. You've always got to be looking around those corners. Right. Right. So. Next slide, please. Yeah. Sorry. OK. What now? All right. Richie. So right now you've got any number of investment strategies. OK. And I'm going to speak to the investment side of the, the house because I'm not a lender. If you're not lending, you're investing. And if you're investing, you've got a ladder, or you have a barbell, or you have a mortgage-backed portfolio. And uh, you just gotta be careful in where you're at in each of those places. The, the mortgage backs are clearly the, the most concerning because there's so many things that could be different about the paper that you're buying. Your ladder strategy, it's just a matter of keeping it full. And we have a lot of credit unions that when rates start falling, they stop investing. Um, and then the, the modified barbell is, can be pretty scary to folks. It's where you sit on a ton of cash and you invest everything out as long as you can on your, your ladder, maybe five years. And these, these strategies are fantastic, okay? And the problem is that everybody right now goes, is this a strategy I need to do going forward? Everything is changing in the world. What do I do here? And just talked ad, ad nauseum about how many complex disruptors bing, bing, there are to what we're doing and how we're managing our balance sheet. The good news is that in all fairness, in all honesty, the, the answer to this is simple. It's just keep doing what you've always done. Fill the ladder. Keep replacing your mortgage-backed securities. None of us in this room are supposed to be Warren Buffett. Okay, None of you are the oracle of Tennessee or anywhere else, and you're not a fund manager. Your job is not to just knock the cover off. And if you're looking for high yield, stop. It doesn't exist. There is none. I mean, where would it come from? So stop trying to just do the best. I mean, explain to the board what they need to know about the environment. You know, bring people in to explain to them what they need to know, but don't look for the magic bullet um, because there isn't one. So if your ladder is starting to get sparse, fill it back in because it never fails. We've got folks that are trying to figure out when the best time to get back in the market is. Now, let me just ask you this. Is the best time to get in the market at the high point when yields are at their highest? 
I mean, would you load the boat all of a sudden and fill up your entire ladder with the 50 million in cash or whatever you're sitting on all at once because you know now I'm at the top of the market? If you knew it was the top of the market, yeah, you would. But what's going to happen from that point on? As you go on, your portfolio, because inevitably, if you're at the top, the market's going to start falling, your yields are just going to continue to go down from there. So now you're going to explain to your board, well, it's going down because we're staying in the market and the yields are going down. Okay. Or you start at the bottom. And you're, everybody's afraid they're going to start and go in and rebuild their entire ladder at the bottom of the market and load the boat on stuff and then watch the market go up right after they do this and yields are going to rise. And the problem there is you've bought everything and now the board's saying, well, yields are going up. How come our portfolio is it? And as things mature, of course, it, it will start to move up. But it's higher here. It's bugging me. I feel like I got a gnat flying around. Um, the answer is there's no great place to start, okay? There's pros and cons to starting at any point. So the, the goal is just get back in. And if you read our commentary, almost every day we use the word sprinkling or sprinkle. Start putting pieces back together. On any given day, look for the cheapest places where you have empty spots in your, in your bucket and start putting it in. And right now, buy bullets and not treasuries if you can. If you can. I mean, in a normal market, a five-year treasury or a three-year treasury has a 10 to 15 basis point difference in yield from an agency bullet. And that's because the agency bullet has a 12% risk or 20% risk weighting and the treasury is completely risk-free. So you're getting a little bit extra yield for that risk. So I buy a three-year at 115 um, and the treasury is at 1%, it's easy. I want the extra 15 basis points. Well, today it's not like that. Today you can actually find months where the treasury pays better than the bullet or they're right on top of each other. So 115 and 114, or 115 and 113. By the treasury, take the two basis point difference, the lower yield, yes, and by the treasury, not the bullet. Why? Because that treasury is cheap and the bullet is way too expensive. If that spread should be there and it isn't, you're paying too much for the bullet. And you're paying too much because there's not a lot of agency paper out there. And the Fed is gobbling up whatever they can find. So they're taking that stuff away from us. So buy the treasury. A year from now, if you need to sell any of that paper for your loans taking off or two years from now, you're going to get a really good price when you sell that treasury because you bought it when it was cheap. And if you bought the bullet instead, the agency instead, the price isn't going to be nearly as good. It's like, it's like buying a car, you know, wait for the Labor Day sale, go buy your new car on the Labor Day sale. Don't, don't, pay the top dollar price for it. Because if you go to resell it, you've got that much more premium in the price that you pay that you have to recover. Does that, does that make sense? So buy the treasury. If you've got a ladder and you do want more yield, go for our modified barbell, you know, the good old mullet. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but our mullet is, you know, if, if you can imagine your, your investment ladder and you've got all of your maturities here, and then at the very end, where maybe you're a three-year ladder and you can go out five years, you put a couple of, you buy some stuff out here that pays better. And that extra yield on the five-year callables, for example, is adding more horsepower to your yield, okay? You still got your ladder, this is extra money, all right? And we call that the mullet because if you take this bar graph and flip it, you got the party in the back and the business in the front. And when you hear, you know, the ladder is your business and there's the party in the back, okay? So anyway, that's, that's a great way to add a little extra yield to your investment portfolio. Um, I, I probably need to not go into the switching oh, yeah. gears yet. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll back up. The main thing is stay with the same strategy. It, there's not a whole lot of difference here, okay? The world hasn't changed to the point where everything is completely different. There's nowhere else for you to go. The NCUA is not saying you can now go here, you can now go here, you can now go here you still have the same limited options. You just gotta stay in the game. I mean, the world has always gone up and down and been fantastic and then stinks. And the, the sad part about every time the market is awesome, it has to be followed by the stink. It just, it just is. And the difference between professionals and retail is you guys ride the storm. The retail person panics and sells and gets out or gets into the wrong time. I mean, there's always that person you know that says, I'm gonna go out and do this. And then you go and do the exact opposite because you know that person overreacts and whatever they think, you got to do the opposite. And that's the retail side versus in institutional side. So, yeah. sorry. It, it, and you know, we heard yesterday the, the phrase, keep on keeping on, same, same message here. You know, when I was in credit unions, um, Philip was my guy. And so I would call him, you know, I was in credit unions in 2008, 2012, same message, just keep on, 
just keep moving. Don't panic. You'll get through it. Just follow it through. Um, one of the other things that we want to point out to you guys is use your ALM model, whether you use Ball Corp or another ALM model, use your ALM model as you're managing your balance sheet. Um, it's very important. You know, I'm a former CFO and I sat in that chair for many years and, you know, I would get that report. I'd write my ALCO, talk it over with my CEO, look at my interest rate risk, shove it in a drawer and wait for that examiner to come in and pull it back out and go, okay, I've done what you told me to do. You've got to use it. Go in there and use those what ifs capabilities to determine if you're adding more long-term assets and you're, you know, you've got short-term shares. See what happens. See what happens when you buy certain investments. Use it for its full capability so you will know what you're getting into. Because we are seeing credit unions now that their risk has increased from their prior model run and they're calling us going, why? Well, you just did a whole bunch of mortgages and you have no certificates. It's all sitting in liquid cash that could walk out today, right? Another thing that we're seeing is credit unions are not looking at their assumptions. I was speaking with the credit union not too long ago and they said, you know what? We haven't looked at our assumptions in our ALM model for like six to seven years. Well, we're a little different right now. So let's change our assumptions. Let's look at those assumptions. Let's use this tool that's given to us. So that's another strategy that you need to be aware of. So now we have the word complexity. <laughs> so in, in, in the previous slide, we had the disruptors and the bottom one was COVID, which was really tied to all the ones previous to that one. Same thing here. Okay, so what now it's strategy, it's incorporating ALM and other tools and the complexity is gonna involve everything else above. So complexity, simply put, if I am a ladder buyer, maybe I wanna start buying mortgage-backed securities. If I am a mortgage-backed buyer, maybe I wanna add a little bit of, maybe some callables here and there just to, for a little bit of a kick. If I'm a par buyer, maybe I wanna start looking at secondary pieces that have discounts and premiums to them and what kind of yield I can get out of those. And so you're adding complexity to your strategy. You're just modifying a little bit, or in some cases going from a ladder to mortgage backs. And just for those that, that when I say going into mortgage backs, the difference between a ladder, an investment ladder with bullets and treasuries and callables, and then you, your mortgage portfolio is here, you've got maturities coming in every month on your ladder. And on the mortgage backed securities, you rely on the principal paydowns every month as your liquidity. So that is your funding that's coming in. And for anybody that doesn't fully understand the ladder, because there's always somebody in the room who is just quietly going ladder, ladder, ladder. I don't know what that means. Maybe I'll Google it later, whatnot. And you know, you pull up stuff for the little giant and so forth. Laddering means that every month you have maturities coming in from your investment portfolio. And the idea is that I sit on a little bit of cash, January, February, March, April, May, I've got these maturities. This is the expected money that I might need for funding my members' needs on any given month. So the more you can stretch this out and build those maturities every month, the, more, the less cash you need to sit on at low interest rates. So you're making the most of this money. And when you have a full ladder, let's say it's a three-year ladder or a five-year ladder, you know, it just becomes automatic. You spend five minutes a month managing your portfolio. What cash do I have? What do I need? Okay, let's just reinvest. And you don't have to consider where it goes. You just put it all the way at the end. And when it's built, you're always investing at five years now. Or you're always investing at three years. So you're always capturing a better rate than you know, if I'm having to fill in under three years and two years and so forth. It's real easy and automatic. Mortgage backs, the key is making sure that you know what paper you're buying and you understand the, you know, you want to diversify your coupons. You don't want to load the boat on premium paper that is a uh, high interest rate funded. So I've got a $5 premium on a mortgage backed security I bought that is full of paper that is refiable. All right. And what happens now is that you know, ABC broker, I like to call him Joe Schmuckatelli. That's an old Marine Corps term that I love. I'm not saying anybody in particular. I'm just saying Joe Schmuckatelli says, hey, you know, buy this. This is a great bond. We think it's going to pay like this. And I can get you a 120 yield at a 105 handle. All right. It's agency paper. It's pretty safe. And then you buy it. And the speeds pay very differently than they say it would. Or you didn't look at the collateral and go, I disagree with you, man. I don't see how 5% paper is not going to refi out. And every time that 5% mortgage gets refied, that pays off, prepayments speed up, and now you have to write down more of that premium faster. So your 105 premium is now taking yield off of the coupon that you bought on the bond. So I've seen credit unions last year, oh, it was awful. I buy this for a 120. 
Philip and Cassie are offering a 110 or 105. I want the 120, your bond sucks. They buy it. And six months later, they've got 6% negative yield because they're writing down the premium. Their bond sucked. And they got sold because buy it. This is what you want. So you got to be careful when you buy mortgage-backed securities. It ha happens so much. I mean, it's depressing. We had one credit union that wanted to get into mortgage-backed securities. And I'm like, hey, this is great. Awesome. Your portfolio right now is such that we can easily start transitioning you. And we have the conversation. Okay. Here's the conversation. We'll teach you what you need to know. We'll help you get into this. And I don't care if you don't buy it all from us or, or not, I'm, wh whatever. But this is what you need to look for. This is what you don't want to do. This is what you do want to do. Don't chase the yield. I swear. First two purchases, everything's great. And four months later, they bought eight other bonds from somebody else. And it's a year later, we're selling them away from the credit union because they're hemorrhaging negative yields on their portfolio. It's terrible. It happens all the time. So you got to be careful when you're buying these. But, but the idea is that if you're a bullet buyer, you're going to move into mortgage backs smartly, okay? You're not going to go from a 1% to a 1.5% yield because to do that, well, it just doesn't exist. You can put it on paper the first month you buy it, and then when reality starts paying on that bond, your yield's going to look very different. So you just need to understand that. Um, I think you went into your next slide. Next yeah, slide, please. We're ready for the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is perils. Perils. Which is don't chase yield. <laughs> which is what I started to do. Yeah. Don't chase yield. Okay. I'm going to admit I am a muni hater. My name is <laughs> Philip Cochran. I am a hater of munis. Say what munis are. Don't okay. just say munis. Well, I was waiting for somebody to say, welcome, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so munis are municipal issue bonds. So city of Nashville wants to build, uh, wants to redo the bridge, the walking bridge, okay? And they're gonna sell general purpose bonds or municipal bonds that are going to fund this. And uh, it has the full faith and credit of Davidson County. And so you buy these. And most munis are tax-free. So credit unions definitely better be buying taxable munis. If you've got a broker trying to sell you tax-free, you know that person, you know that last name is Schmuckatelli. And don't, don't listen. I've been a hater forever. I, I'm sorry I don't trust cities and municipalities um, to manage their books well. And, and show of hands, anybody in this room who trusts that local governments are doing a good job, they're good stewards of your money? Can I just get a show of hands? Oh, oh get red. out of here, Carter. <laughs> oh, red means no. Okay. Oh, we red were, means no. We, okay. We were a little worried. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody trusts them. So why are we going to go buy their bonds? Because yeah. we think the federalities are going to come bail them out. Just don't. Stay away from them. Now, I will admit that the horrible catastrophe that is the municipal bond in my head has never actually come to fruition. But that doesn't mean it isn't going to at some point. Uh, 2019, Warren Buffett said, stay away from munis. There's nothing good about munis, and it's going to get really bad over the next couple of years. That was before the pandemic hit. Now, after the pandemic hit, there was nothing better in the world to now make munis that the Oracle was saying stay away from attractive. So stay away from munis, all right? You're gonna chase yield, I get it. Risk versus reward is there for a reason. The problem is you're gonna get 20 more basis points and risk all of your principal for it. We're not talking about going from 5% to 9%. We're talking about going from 1% to 1.2%. That is ridiculous. It is, you don't need that. Your board is not going to say, here's a bonus. Here's your new Mercedes because you got 20 extra basis points on the portfolio. But they could fire you when you lose the first million dollars of one of those meetings that you buy. So don't chase yield. Don't buy 105 and 110 handle um, mortgage-backed securities in this environment. And if you're going to, you better make sure that they're like a 0% mortgage, okay? That there's no risk of refi and that thing's gonna stay out there for the long run because otherwise you're gonna lose your shirt. And we see it. You're not lending as much as you want, I get it. When you do make loans, maybe they're riskier right now. Interest rates aren't as good. And that's, what, that's how you make your bread and that's how you butter your bread. But it's, 
it's okay to take the risk on your members. It's not okay to take your risk on Schmuckatelli. And, and if you have questions, shoot us your ideas and we'll look at them. We'll be perfectly honest with you. Yes, sir? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> there you go. He's a little passionate. Yeah, I'm but sorry. He, yeah. <laughs> It just shows his passion for the industry and for his credit unions, right? We um, have had credit unions in the past ask us to sell stuff that we thought was inappropriate, and we'll tell them no. And it's not a comfortable conversation, but I go to sleep at night. And that's a hell of a lot more important, no offense, than making everybody in this room happy for five minutes. I want you to be happy with me forever, not for five minutes. I don't want you to come calling me later on or Cassidy and saying, hey, why did you sell this to me? Uh, because we're stupid, because yeah, we don't care. Look, Jeff likes to use the analogy of the gas station. Most people go buy gas and they don't care where they get the gas, in and out, and they're gone. This is different. You know where I live. You own me. The broker dealer that you buy from from us is yours. You own it. Jeff is my boss and you're his boss. So if you're unhappy, you're going to call him up and say, Philip sucks. He did this, blah, 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 blah. And Jeff's just going to be like, what, what? It's going to be like the Christmas story all over again. And you're going to hear me screaming in the background, getting the soap shoved in my mouth while, you know. So we really do care, okay? And it's not just because we want to keep our job. I mean, let's be honest, you guys are our family. So it matters a whole lot. And we want to sleep at night. Yep. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, perspective. <laughs> this is very interesting. All right, so we started off asking the question, who thinks interest rates are gonna go up in 22, 23, and 24? And let's talk about that for a second, okay? Because 23 is what the market thinks. Um, and the market is pushing for, and that actually, that um was part of my thought process. That wasn't a filler, <laughs> that was really, okay. So the market thinks rates are going up in 23. The market is also now calling for the Fed to make definitive statements that say that they're going to stop buying back securities. Now, the Fed controls the Fed target rate. And when we talk about interest rates, we're talking about market rates, but we're really talking about the Fed target rate to begin with, which right now is at zero to 25. And that's the range that the Fed says that we should all be lending to one another if we need cash. And they set that rate and the market tries to follow it and everything kind of benches off of that. The Fed also controls interest rates by buying securities in the market. So they buy 30-year mortgage-backed uh, securities in order to push down 30-year mortgage-backed rates. They buy all of these long-term investments for the sake of pushing the yield down on those because a bond is inverse to a, a stock. When you buy a bond, um, the price goes up, but the yield goes down. So if I've got a bond that pays 10%, and at par, I'm getting 10%. If I buy that bond for uh, anything over par, I'm not getting a 10% yield anymore. I'm getting paid a 10% coupon, but I got to write off that premium. So my yield has fallen from 10%. Does that make sense? It's an inverse relationship. So you buy investment, you buy bonds, yields get pushed down. The Fed's buying bonds. They're funding this huge balance sheet that they've got. So the first step to them raising the Fed target rate is to stop buying securities or slow down their repurchasing. And if they slow down their repurchasing, that's supposed to be the first indicator. And that's going to allow take some of the pressure off of yields being forced down. They stop buying, they slow down, yields start coming up. Lo and behold, more paper becomes available to the rest of us and things start improving and it's a slow process and they call it tapering, okay? And they wanna do this slowly because they wanna avoid what's called the taper tantrum where the market goes, oh, Fed's doing this, it's starting now. Oh my God, what have I done? And everybody just sells everything and goes crazy and because they think that you know, they, they own the apocalypse. The Fed wants to make sure that that goes slowly. So they're gonna start easing off on their purchases, let rates go up. The market now wants them to say that they're gonna start doing that towards the end of this year, or, or towards the end of, yeah, towards the end of this year, which means going into next year, they're no longer purchasing securities all year. And then they want them to be able to start raising rates as early as the beginning of 2023. That's what they're pushing for right now. Will it happen? Who knows? I mean, if the government keeps pumping money in everything and nobody wants to go to work. By the way, has anybody heard that the IRS wants visibility in your share accounts? Did you guys know that? I see some saying yes, some saying no. Yeah, guess what? 
84 is here, Orwellian times are coming, okay? The IRS wants the ability to monitor cash going in and out of your members' accounts. Anybody wanna hazard a guess as to why? Come on, Carter. Okay, you know we don't have any plants in the audience because they just, I guess they're sick and they didn't show up. Um, it's because they know that people, they're, they're saying, why aren't you working? You're making money on the side. You're not paying taxes. You're doing something. The IRS wants to be able to track this, okay? Because people are still alive. We're not dropping off a million at a time in starvation, even though we're not all going back to work. So they want to monitor this. So essentially what's happening, okay, is the Fed is eventually going to slow down their purchases. Then they're going to start raising interest rates if the economy allows it. And right now the economy definitely allows it. All the things we see coming down the pike with demand and inflation and so forth, they almost have to. But what's that going to do to the economy? So the perspective that I want everybody to get here is, um, and can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Looking at the 10-year treasury, okay, which is where all of our mortgage back or our mortgages really fund from or, or benchmark off of, this graph right here is looking at uh, 19, uh, September 30th, 1981 through the present. And that is the 10-year treasury yield. And you can see that it's steadily gone down and you've had spikes up and down and it's really rigid, okay? It looks like your DeWalt handsaw. And this is looking at a 40 year view. Now imagine if you zoomed in on that on a one month or a 12 month period, those tiny little teeth start looking really big and all of a sudden it's not the Smokies, it's the Andes, right? In other words, there's a lot of volatility there in yield, huge volatility. But we've gone, we've basically just gone down for the last 40 years. Now look at the next slide. In the next slide here, this is the Fed target rate going back to 2000. And we picked 2000 because uh, it was right before 9-11. It was right before you know, we had a couple of our biggest disruptors, if you will. And what I want to point out here is everybody right now says the Fed needs to start raising rates. And if you look at the end of this graph, you'll see that we've been in this negative rate environment for a year and a half, or this low rate environment for a year and a half. Now you see that big flat gap behind it? That's 2008 to middle of 2015, all right? Right now, we're a year and a half in. We're like, we're not even a fourth of the way through the time it took for the Fed to raise rates the last time. And the last time was just the housing bubble burst. We're in pandemic. We burst the bubble. We skyrocketed home values. We're screaming about inflation. We're cutting down supply chains. We're on the verge of high energy costs. I mean, right now, dogs and cats are sleeping together. We're looking at a 600 pound Twinkie, you know? Right now, my point is, is a lot worse than it was in 2008. And we're, we're a year and a half into this and we expect the Fed now to start raising rates. And last time it took them a decade, almost. Okay, so seven and a half years, but still, I don't have a spreadsheet in front of me. Perspective. I'm not saying they're not gonna raise rates. I'm not saying they're not gonna stop. I don't know what they're gonna do. They won't take my calls anymore. <laughs> but if they don't raise rates, it's not gonna surprise me, how's that? And if you're sitting back on the sideline waiting for them to raise rates, get off the bench. You know, the movie, The Replacements with Gene Hackman, mm. when, when he's talking to, uh, or no, no, I'm sorry, it, uh, The Rock. It was The Rock and it was Sean Connery. And, and he's talking to Nicolas Cage and, you know, he's, he's like, you could do this, you could do this. And he's like, you know, I'll do my best. And Sean Connery says, I'll do my best. Losers always say, I'll do my best. Winner goes home with the prom queen. <laughs> and then the, the replacements, when he says, you know, do you want the ball to Keanu Reeves or do you want to hand off? You want to make the pass? You want to run and play? What do you want to do? And he says, I want the ball. And Gene Ackman says, of course, winners always want the ball. Get off the bench. You're not gonna win sitting on the sideline, right? Get in the game. Nobody knows what's gonna happen. Anybody says they do, they're lying to you. Go somewhere else. Come to me, I'll tell you how stupid I am. I don't have an ego, it's okay. Really, I don't know. And I'm okay with that. And I'm doing the best I can, I'm staying in the market. And as the market goes up, so will my yield. And when the market comes down, so will my yield. But you know what? I'll be able to explain it to my board. I'm just doing my job, I'm staying in the market. Thank you, that's what they'll say. And I'm doing better than cash. One last thing, 
and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here. I think the, it's the audience okay. question next. Yeah, you're good. One last thing. So if you're trying to figure out what to do with the pandemic funds, the high liquidity, go back and look at what your cash level was prior to March of 2020. If you've got 20 more million after that, don't invest that whole 20 million, okay? Because we don't know how fast that money is going to go out the door. That's money that's come in from all this, you know, voodoo funding that the government's been throwing at us. Not saying that they're doing the wrong thing, because we're all still alive. I don't know what the right thing is. I have the advantage of, just like when Tony Romo was a Cowboys quarterback. Yes, sorry, Cowboys fan. On any given Sunday, I was a better quarterback than Tony Romo. So I get it. Just figure out how much cash you had to begin with. If you want our help, we'll help you leave a big chunk of that. If your ladder is solid bulletproof, you can invest more of those excess funds. But if it's not bulletproof, let's work on that first. So, world sucks. It's Welcome to Forum 2021. <laughs> yeah, right? It's Thanks extremely complex, but really the answer is still the same and it's really simple. Okay, just stay in the game. Don't chase yield. Do your best. Take the ego out of it. I went to a men's conference a couple years ago and they, they said that it was a, it was a Lifeway uh, men's conference and they said that ego stood for edging God out. So leave the ego, just do what's best. Don't try and knock anybody's socks off. Just try and keep the, the lights on and you'll be fine. Sorry. No, you're good. Okay. Now, does that change your answer? Yeah. Yeah. New question. <laughs> yeah. 22. Do I see any reds? 23 rates are going to increase. Do I see some greens? What about 24 upside down? Do you still see some 24s? I see a lot of people not answering. Yeah. So <laughs> I think a lot of people want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so my whole uh, winners want the ball speech just fell flat. Yeah, huh? sure <laughs> did, huh? no. But again, the story is just keep on keeping on. Do your best. Manage to it. We'll get through it. Whole Corp's here to help you fill up with investments. I can help you with ALM. So thank you. Thanks.